Good afternoon. My name is Kent Mormon, and I am the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as Dr. Cog TAC. I call the or to order the October 26, 2020 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. As a reminder for agenda items, questions, or comments, please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you are also unmuted on your end. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Again, please raise your hand, use the raise your hand feature to ask questions related to the agenda items. At this time, um, would go ahead and have roll call and Cam um, Kennedy, who's our new division assistant with Dr. Cog, um, and has taken the place of Melinda. Would you please uh, uh, list all attendees? And if for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added to the record. Cam? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. In attendance today, we have Aaron Bastoy, Alex Hyde Wright, Andrea Larray. Bill Soros, Brad Calvert, Brooke Svoboda, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, Carson Priest, Chris Coven, Chris Hudson, Daniel Hutton, David Gaspers, David Krutzinger, David Ulane, Don Sluter, uh, Flo Rotano, George Polakoff, Heather Camper, James Usen, Jan Rowe, Jeff Da um, Kringber, uh, Jennifer Carpenter, Jessica Michael Bust, Jordan Riddell, Karen Schuneters, uh Kelly Hutton, Kevin Ash, Lauren Pulver, Lawrence Trelong, Lisa Wen, Matthew Helfant, Melanie Choquette. Mike Whittaker, Myron Hora, Phil Greenwald, Peep Van Hoven, Richard Pilgrim, Sangu Lee, Sarah Grant, Steve Cook, Stephen Duran, Sue Pratt, and Tom Reef. Thank you. Again, if you uh, did not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy dot at or ckennedy at drcog.org. We will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up your comments and your line will be muted. Cam, can you please unmute uh, all participants at this time? And are there any of your hands raised, Cam? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first question we have is from uh, Peep Van Hoven. So, Peep, I will un. I believe everybody should be unmuted. And Peep, uh, go ahead. Hi. Testing to see if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Oh, great. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Peep Van Heuven. We've lost seems you. Seems to be bouncing back and forth. How's this? That's better. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peep Van Heuven, Director of Government Relations at Bicycle Colorado, and thanks for the opportunity. We'd like to comment on the MetroVision RTP you'll be considering today. Um, first, we want to say thanks to you and Dr. Cog's staff for the work, uh, including excellent performance measures in the plan related to non-single occupancy vehicle mode share and reducing traffic fatalities. We're also really happy to see the impactful multimodal projects like the investments in regional bus rapid transit and safety and vision zero and regional trails and other bike ped projects. We have two recommendations we hope you'll consider today. The first 
In order to be sure you successfully meet GHD reduction and air quality goals, we suggest an analysis of emissions and climate impacts that'll result from the project's package before you finalize this list. It looks like about 70% of the current package is dedicated to road widening and construction projects that can cause pollution. And we think it's important to be sure our region isn't a significant driver of more emissions that harm residents and visitors to the front range in the state. We also think it's important to pause today's vote and be sure the package of projects aligns with the state of Colorado's reduction targets that will be identified as early as next month by the Colorado Energy Office. With climate change and air quality at the forefront of the state and metro region discussions and the EPA's designation that the Denver metro area is in serious non-attainment under the Clear Clean Air Act, it's important to pause to be sure we get our transportation slate right in the next 10 to 30 years. And right now, a $7 billion investment in road projects seems incongruent with the goal of 96% reduction in emissions. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. I just want to close um, by thanking you again for all of the hard work on developing the regional priorities. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Um, Cam, are there any uh, others that wish to speak? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Next, we have uh, Sue Prant. So Sue, I'm, uh, you should be able to, to talk now. Go ahead, Sue. You might be muted on your end, Sue. Sue, we can't, we can't quite hear you. Okay, Sue, uh, if you could message us in the question box, we could definitely come back to you. Um, but Mr. Chair, we do have another question. Um, it looks like Brian Weimer has an announcement order. Brian, uh, if you would like, you, you can speak now. Yeah, only thing I, I, I didn't hear my name, so I just put in there to say that I was attending the meeting, thanks. Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay. See, were you able to unmute or 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 um, on at this time? Hello, 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 hello. We got hello, you. Hello. We, yes. we, we've got now you. Now you hear me? Yes. Now you hear me? Yes. Okay. Odd. Um, okay. Uh, Thanks for uh, for letting me talk, and I'll be really quick. So um, my name is Supran. I'm from Community Cycles, and we're a membership organization in Boulder. We um, have over 2,500 members, and uh, we advocate for safe bicycles and also teach people how to uh, ride and repair their bicycles. Um, so I want to totally echo what Peep said. Um, she said it really well, so I, I'll just uh, draw on a few points. Um, again, thanking you for the work, the hard work you've done, but also asking mm -hmm. you to pause and consider this MetroVision plan where there is over 70, or around 70% of highway expansion, including road widings, interchanges, and increased capacity. And considering all that our communities are doing to try and combat climate change and um, work to provide multimodal multi multi opportunities for our citizens, um, this seems very much at odds to have all this road widening and interchanges, increased capacities, and additionally with all the climate issues we are facing now, including the two largest wildfires in our state's history. So um, we, we don't see this, we see this as not really congruent with everything that's being done on the state level and in, and in municipalities of Colorado. So 
uh, we ask you to reconsider this this Metro Vision plan and all the increased capacity that you are considering. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Cam, do we have any additional comments or hands raised or? Yes, yes, we do, Mr. Chair. Uh, next, okay. we have Art Griffith. Uh, so, Art, when you're ready, go ahead. Um, yeah, I entered a little late, and I had to log in twice, and it said that I was in a listen mode early, so I'm not sure if you're hearing my comments or not. We hear them. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Art. Oh, that was it. I, I had okay. to log in twice, and it said... Gotcha. Okay. Cam, are there any additional comments or hands raised? Or... Uh, no, Mr. Chair, not at this time. Are there any on the phone that wanted to, to speak? Cam, if you'd take a, please take a moment to uh, mute everyone. I'd appreciate it. Okay. Um, is there any discussion? We'll move on to the October 5th uh, TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion or questions about um, the October 5th, 2020 TAC meeting? Please use your raise hand button to indicate if you, you have a question or would like to speak. Once it's your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you are also unmuted on your end. Cam, are there any hands raised at this time? No, Mr. Chair, there are not any hands being raised at this time. Then the uh, the minutes stand as, as written and, and uh, are approved. The um, next item is a briefing on the Colorado Greenhouse uh, Gas Pollution Reduction Roadmap recommendations. And I believe Robert Spots and, uh, will, will be leading this discussion. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually just going to be introducing Kay Kelly from CDOT, who's going to give an overview of House Bill 191261. This is the law that was signed uh, last year in May concerning the reduction of greenhouse gas pollution in uh, the state. Uh, some short term and long term uh, targets for uh, greatly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, last September, the roadmap, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Roadmap was released, outlining some key uh, initiatives and policy um, prospects for um, achieving these goals. Uh, so Kay is going to go over a little bit of history of the, the law, where we're at now, and then you know, obviously this will affect all sectors in the state, including transportation, which is of key interest to Dr. Cog. So with that, I will hand it over to Kay, and thank you very much for being here, Kay. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, appreciate the opportunity to present. Um, can you confirm that you can see my slides okay? Yes, we have them. Thank you. All right, excellent. Um, so, uh, so my name is Kay Kelly. Um, I'm currently serving as the interim director of the Office of Innovative Mobility at CDOT. Um, I'm actually on loan to CDOT from the Colorado Energy Office, where I've been uh, the transportation climate change specialist for the Energy Office since uh, January. Um, and in that position, I've been working on interagency collaboration around really all things transportation, energy, air quality, climate um, within the state. Um, so uh, my goal today, I'm going to go over some general background on the greenhouse gas roadmap. Uh, we'll talk in more specifics on the transportation recommendations because I think those will be uh, most relevant to this group. Um, and then I believe we'll open it up to Q&A at the end. Uh, so, so with that, we'll dive right in. Um, so back in 2018, Governor Polis ran on a platform of pursuing bold climate action for the state, um, getting us to 100% renewable energy by 2040. Um, and as you can see, energy and renewables is one of what he's calling his bold four priorities for um, his administration. And in 2000, 
2019 legislative session, we saw you know more than a dozen clean energy bills passed. Among those is um, you know the topic of what we're talking about today, which is House Bill 191261, which set the greenhouse gas reduction goals for the state. Um, those are a 26% reduction by 2025, a 50% reduction by 2030, and a 90% reduction by 2050. Those are all compared to a 2005 baseline. Um, and you know that legislation really uh, directed the state to take action. Um, among that is you know laying all this analytical groundwork um, that I'm going to present today, that's really helping us understand where our emissions are coming from, and you know most importantly, what our options are across all sectors of the economy for for reducing them. Um, I won't go into too much detail on um, kind of the other things here, but um, you'll see that uh, there's. Uh, been a very swift transition to renewables, um, lots of uh, strong policy language for utilities to reduce pollution. Um, we've had heard multiple um, utilities announcing early reductions of um, uh, fossil energy uh, electric. Uh, so um, so that's kind of moving us in a, in a really good direction. Um, there's a lot of uh, progress on the zero emission vehicle front. Um, we did adopt the ZEV rule, one of the first states in a long time to do so. Um, this summer, we launched a clean trucking strategy. Um, lots of things going on um, in the oil and gas area. Um, lots of stuff around um, uh, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, Reg 22, um, stuff happening with the Natural and Working Lands Task Force um, for the uh, rural and agricultural areas of the state. Um, we also established an office of just transition, which is, you know, looking at these communities that have, you know, historically been dependent on, you know, fossil resources for, you know, their economic activity um, and making sure that they're not left behind um, for the, the greenhouse gas roadmap. Um, and then importantly, there's uh, a division at the Department of Public Health and Environment that's developing our state climate equity framework. Um, that's looking to really develop um, good community engagement um, with some groups who've you know, historically not been included in uh, policy conversations around you know, things that, that impact them. And we know that you know, a lot of our um, communities, our low-income communities and communities of color are disproportionately impacted by, um, by environmental harms. So um, that's where we've been uh, in terms of where we're going from here. Let me see if I can advance my slide again. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, so really the, the roadmap process kicked off last spring with the signing of that House Bill 1261. Um, we've had a multi-agency effort underway since then. Um, that's been led by the Colorado Energy Office, um, but there are you know half a dozen state agencies that are actively involved in the process along with um, our contractor who's um, Energy Environmental Economics or E3, who's been doing you know, a lot of the calculation work. Um, in the spring, we really kicked off, you know, this uh, stakeholder and public engagement process, trying to get feedback on various scenarios that we've been developing to date, um, trying to gather input on the types of actions that the state should be considering to get us to our goals. Um, we issued a public comment draft of the roadmap um, on September 30th. Um, I'd encourage everyone to take a look at it if you haven't already. Um, we are planning, um, so our official date for public comments um, that is through November 1st at 5 p.m., um, but there's also an extended deadline for official and elected bodies um, to provide comments through November 12th. Um, 30 days just wasn't enough time for um, some of those folks to have their meetings and conversations about this in order to submit um, feedback on behalf of groups like that. So. Um, we want the feedback as soon as possible, no later than the 12th. Um, we'd like to have as much of it as possible by the 1st, though, because we really do need to hunker down and process all that final feedback before we issue the final draft of the roadmap um, at the end of November. Um, to give you an idea of you know, some of the folks we've been talking to, um, we've had um, this slide, I feel like, is out of date. Um, it says 40 plus meetings. I'm sure there have been more than 60 at this point. Um, but you know, we, we do have a technical advisory group who's been providing technical guidance on the model and the assumptions that feed into each of the scenarios. Um, a lot of our um, universities and national labs are involved in that. 
Um, we've been giving regular monthly updates to the Air Quality Control Commission since about January, um, presentations to the Transportation Commission and other state boards and commissions. Um, we've also been meeting with groups of sector-specific stakeholders to really dig into the topic areas that they're most interested in. Um, we've met with business groups. We've met with local governments from across the state. Um, the CDPHE climate team has been leading the outreach efforts to um, impacted communities, again, to, to make sure that they're included and that their voices and viewpoints are heard um, when historically we know that they have been they have not been um, and we also have a public feedback portal on our website that um, gets comments uh, pretty much every day um, we've also uh, we held two evening public meetings on this we had one in august and another just last week um, between those two meetings we've engaged um, you know, around 500 people just from those two meetings alone. So really lots of conversations out there in the community about um, this process and the recommendations. Uh, so getting into the details, um, our first step in the roadmap process was to establish uh, what our state baseline greenhouse gas inventory is, which you see here. Um, so this is giving us a sector by sector look at where our emissions have traditionally been coming from. Um, you'll see that electricity generation and transportation are two pretty big pieces of the pie here. Um, and then the rest of that is made up by you know, non-energy buildings and industrial energy. Um, in the electricity generation uh, sector, you'll see that you know, this has traditionally been very coal heavy. Um, but again, we know that transition is definitely coming here um, with all those voluntary early coal plant retirements being announced. Um, so, you know, this baselining exercise really gave the team some good insight into what the opportunity areas are for us to, you know, further pursue these greenhouse gas reductions and, you know, transportation with that, you know, electricity sector um, shrinking, transportation is, is really a big area of focus for the roadmap. Um, as part of the process, we also built these three scenarios. Um, the top blue line is our reference scenario. This line represents really the, the business as usual forecast as if nothing in that 2019 legislative session had happened. Um, that was our trajectory prior to 2019. Uh, the next line down, the gold line, is our 2019 action scenario. That captures all of that 2019 legislation that I just mentioned, um, captures all the voluntary utility commitments, um, through 2019, um, and then it takes all those and it forecasts out the long-term impacts of those events and those policies. Um, so, you know, making pretty good progress right out of the gate, um, closing a gap, the gap quite a bit for that near-term 2025 target, but still quite a ways to go um, to get to the 2050 target. We can't get there just on the 2019 actions alone. Um, the final line, the red one, is our House Bill 1261 target scenario. Um, this is what we think it's actually going to take across all sectors of our economy to actually reach our targets. Um, and then the last two scenarios, um, the, the gold and the red, um, you see there's also a dotted line there as well. Um, we put those through a COVID sensitivity analysis based on some of the variables associated with the pandemic that were emerging and that we felt like we needed um, to take a closer look at um, things that we thought were going to impact our greenhouse gas trajectory the most. Um, those are things like population changes, VMT reductions, and um, what we're seeing in the oil and gas production sector, which is, you know, some pretty sustained declines. Um, so, you know, as, as a result of actions to date, you know, we are on this trajectory to achieve about half the level of emission reductions we need to meet 2025 and 2030 goals. Um, and COVID kind of pushes us closer to that, um, but again, levels off after you know about 2030. Um, we really do have a lot of work to do to close the gap between the gold and the red lines uh, to actually meet that House Bill 1261 target out to 2050. Um, so how are we closing the gap? How are we approaching that? Um, to orient you, that top line here is the reference case and the bottom line is the 1261 target. Um, and you can see a bunch of sample strategies um, as these colored wedges on the left um, with the size of the boxes on the right really kind of showing us the scale of change each of those policies achieves. Um, you know, this is good for helping us visualize the magnitude of what we're tackling. Um, you can see 
So clean electricity and oil and gas, um, the big blue and brown boxes, um, have some pretty big reductions in them, um, but it's also going to take a lot of actions from, from other areas of the economy as well um, to get us all the way to the target. Um, so again, you know, this is the magnitude of reductions necessary in each sector. Um, through about 2030, you'll, you'll notice that this is largely a story about electricity and, and about oil and gas. Um, those wedges are shrinking really quickly in the early years of the time scale here. And past 2030, all the colored wedges are seeing these really significant reductions. And, you know, we're talking about a 96% reduction in transportation, 100% reductions in buildings. Um, and all of this we know is going to require really high levels of collaboration uh, with you know, state agencies, with local communities, utilities, businesses, with the public. Um, so you know, the, this, is, this is our path. Um, these are the goals that we've set and, and they are quite ambitious. Um, so the roadmap document itself is, is published on our website. You're, everyone's welcome to go and take a look at it. It is a very lengthy document. Um, it's you know 175 pages or something. Um, and the next few slides uh, really boils down to the list of recommended near-term legislative and regulatory actions that um, can be taken across all sectors of the economy and, and they're grouped by sector. Um, so I'll just go through these quickly and then again, we'll, we'll dive into the transportation stuff more um, after I get through the, the full list. But um, on the electricity front, uh, clean energy plans and regional haze um, are at the top of the list, along with the idea for some performance-based regulations at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, the transportation list is, is largely about shifting transportation energy sources um, away from fossil toward our much cleaner electric grid. Um, it's also um, talking about meaningfully accounting for emissions in our planning efforts. Um, and then um, taking steps to change behaviors such that, you know, we aren't driving single occupant vehicles anymore, um, that we're, you know, bringing down our vehicle miles traveled with smart land use decisions, um, that we're increasing opportunities for public transit. Um, again, we'll get into that a little more later. Um, like transportation, uh, buildings are also likely to see a shift to electrification along with across the board energy efficiency improvements, um, commercial building performance standards, energy tracking, things like that. Uh, we're likely to see continued rulemakings at the AQCC on methane um, and hydrofluorocarbons. Um, I am not as well versed in the agricultural elements of the plan, but there are some existing successful programs that are addressing energy efficiency and soil health um, and other items. Um, those are ongoing. Um, you can see them here on the slide. And if folks have specific questions about that, I can I can find the right expert for you. Um, I'll also note that we do have a very active natural and working lands group. Um, they're addressing carbon sequestration and other things there. Um, and then finally, um, in the waste sector, um, really thinking about how we address methane emissions from coal mines, from landfills, from sewage treatment plants, um, from agricultural sources. Um, and you know things like renewable natural gas um, also fit into this category. And from there, um, really just kind of blowing up that transportation list, because um, again, I think this is probably the area that's um, most the focus of this group. Uh, so uh, the first transportation recommendation is integrating greenhouse gas pollution standards and analysis um, into our regional and statewide transportation plans. Um, so, you know, the, the statewide transportation plan, the regional transportation plans, um, the state transportation improvement plans, all of these things are really key documents that are establishing our funding priorities for future years, for future decades. Um, but they're not currently factoring in the estimated increases or decreases in greenhouse gas emissions. We, we are doing this as part of the conformity process for things like ozone and other criteria pollutants. And we do think that this recommendation would mirror that conformity process. Um, the specifics of this will need to be developed, you know, through uh, collaboration between CDPHE and CDOT um, and the major metropolitan planning areas, um, especially those like Dr. Cog that are in our non-attainment areas. Um, but really the basic idea here is to establish greenhouse gas budgets and look at projects through that lens so that you know, we can really evaluate them accordingly for their impact um, on greenhouse gas emissions. 
Um, along with this, the state is also um, looking at ways to more fully incorporate greenhouse gases into you know, more than just kind of the plans, really thinking about how this looks um, at the project level and envir environmental review stage as well. Uh, next up is transportation demand management. Um, I think we're all familiar with this. This is really you know, around reducing vehicle miles traveled. Um, of particular interest here is the recommendation that a trip reduction requirement is developed for large employers um, that would require them um, employers over a certain size threshold to be determined um, to develop transportation demand management programs for their employees. Um, I know RAC is looking at this already um, very closely, um, but you know, again, thinking about ways that we get commuters out of cars um, and into other um, more sustainable modes of transportation to get to and from the office, if they even have to use a transportation mode uh, in the first place. Um, freight is another key target area. Um, we, uh, if you did not see um, back in July, um, CDOT, CDPHE, and the Energy Office um, announced that um, we were going to be developing a medium and heavy duty strategy um, for transportation. Um, we're looking at a lot of ideas, um, which I'll cover on the next slide. Um, we're working with the Colorado motor carriers and a lot of stakeholders to really think about which of these are going to be the most impactful and reasonable things to do. Um, you know, trucks are working vehicles. These are, these are not recreational vehicles. So we really need to make sure that, um, you know, whatever we do here, that the technology is ready um, and that the fleets are ready um, to put these vehicles to use and be able to depend on them um, to do their job that they're required to do. Um, so among that, um, thinking about um, opportunities for fleet turnover. Um, you know, we're, we're looking into the numbers here, but we do know that, you know, a large percentage of our medium and heavy duty trucks are not meeting, um, you know, 2014 emission standards. We have a, a high percentage of really old trucks on the road. Um, so thinking about how we can um, move those to move those off out of our fleet and move to, you know, cleaner, more modern emissions technologies. Um, we're thinking about how we can develop the infrastructure to support zero emission vehicles in heavy duty fleets. Um, we've made some good progress on the light duty front, um, but you know, medium and heavy duty vehicles require kind of a higher caliber of infrastructure. So thinking about how we do that smartly, um, how we do it along the key freight corridors um, so that you know, we're tackling those areas where, where trucks are routinely driving uh, which also has the co-benefit of, you know, a lot of those um, high freight traffic areas tend to be our disproportionately impacted communities as well. So really thinking about how we can have those air quality benefits from uh, zero emission vehicles accruing very directly in those communities that have been impacted by, you know, noise and emissions from these trucks for, for many years. Um, we are looking at the potential adoption of the advanced clean truck standard. Um, that is something that we are evaluating. We have not um, made a decision on that yet, but we do have um, the ability to adopt that um, through Section 177 of the Clean Air Act, similar to how we adopted the light duties of standard. Um, so that's a decision that has not been made yet, but we're kind of doing the technical analysis on whether that makes sense. Um, we do know that, you know, there's a lot of last mile freight stuff um, a lot of opportunity in, in that area, especially as a lot of our, our residents and consumers have, have kind of shifted their, their buying behavior to have things delivered to their door. So thinking about how we can um, take advantage of that sector to make some big, um, make some big strides. Uh, we do also understand that, you know, we need to be working with our dealerships and with our maintenance shops so that way um, these groups are prepared for when the vehicles enter our marketplace. Um, we don't want to be in a situation where, you know, fleets in the mountains who adopt these vehicles have to flatbed them down to the front range or out of state in order to get them serviced. Um, so thinking about ways that we can support our VOTEC programs um, and our dealerships to make sure that our technicians are ready for them. Um, also looking at existing programs like EPA SmartWay, um, which helps um, fleets uh, increase their efficiency. Um, and then of course, you know, the state wants to lead by example here. We wanna make sure that, you know, if, we're, if we are putting a, a clean truck standard in place, 
um, that we want to be making sure that our state fleet is uh, is adhering to that, you know, in addition to the, the public. So um, making sure that we're purchasing these trucks as they become available. Um, funding is also obviously key, um, especially, you know, in a state like Colorado that's um, revenue constrained. Uh, we know that we're going to need some significant public investment to support electrification of medium and heavy duty vehicles in particular, um, not just the vehicles, but um, uh, the infrastructure as well. Um, we also um, know that we're going to need more investment to accelerate light duty vehicle electrification um, and also to make sure that it's equitable. Um, we want to make sure that our lower income um, residents that have tend to have the, the older, more inefficient cars are able to upgrade to electric vehicles um, or other zero emission vehicles as they become available. Um, we do know that the, you know, we, we don't have this funding available um, in the general fund right now. Um, we would need to um, explore, um, you know, bondable methods so that we can have some long-term revenue. Um, and we are, proposing putting together a clean transportation uh, funding package um, so that you know we can start thinking about how we can pay for some of these investments. Um, land use planning decisions um, also very important. You know, Colorado um, has local control. Um, so you know a lot of these land use planning decisions are made at the local level, at the regional level. Um, but they do have pretty significant impacts on our vehicle miles traveled. Um, we know that we need to be thinking about designing um, and building communities that are allowing for encouraging um, modes of transportation that are decreasing emissions. So, you know, things like biking and walking and transit. Um, we're thinking about ways that we can incentivize local governments to make land use decisions that are placing housing near jobs, uh, placing major trip destinations like grocery stores and schools um, and things that you know attract a lot of vehicle traffic closer to where people live, um, closer to public transit so that single occupant vehicles aren't your only option to, to get to that destination. Um, so you know we're going to be working with local governments um, with MPOs um, to start thinking about this more, how we can be promoting more sustainable land use. Um, how we might develop criteria so that we're putting our limited state transportation dollars toward uh, projects and decisions that are in alignment with kind of where we're trying to go with the greenhouse gas roadmap with our VMT reduction goals. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing to, to highlight here is that we know that um, land use planning strategies have this beneficial multiplier effect. So, you know, if you pair land use planning policies with vehicle electrifications or with transit, transportation improvements, you know, bus rapid transit, other things like that, we know that we're going to get higher greenhouse gas reductions by pairing them than, you know, doing any of this stuff in isolation. So they, they really do work hand in hand. Um, next is uh, indirect source standards. This is another strategy. Um, so um, indirect sources are uh, defined in the Clean Air Act as sources which generate or attract motor vehicle activities. So these are places like shopping malls or um, developments, office buildings, warehouses, industrial sites. Um, and this is really a way to target the large attractors of mobile sources in addition to just the mobile sources themselves. Um, so if we would implement this type of regulation, um, you know, we think we could be encouraging some more sustainable multimodal transit oriented development. Um, and then uh, making sure that um, any impacts they have would generate kind of offsetting mitigation measures um, that we can use to support transit electrification um, or other greenhouse gas reducing strategies. Um, and this is the, the final transportation recommendation. This one's around public transit um, and really how we can be setting the stage for longer term uh, public infrastructure projects, things like front range passenger rail um, this is again about addressing vehicle miles traveled, um, things like more support for active transportation, walking and biking, um, investing in physical infrastructure such as mobility hubs or light rail or commuter rail, um, could also include things like more regular um, service along existing transit routes, um, bus rapid transit on congested corridors, 
you know, the, this recommendation is largely about behavior change, um, making sure that it's safe and convenient um, and desirable for folks to use a transportation method that isn't a single occupant vehicle. Um, and, you know, thinking about how we would incorporate these elements into our future transportation funding packages, how we could prioritize multimodal options um, in how we're programming existing revenue streams. Um, so things like that. I think I've got one more slide. So, um, you know, a, a lot of information um, and, you know, do encourage folks to, to read the roadmap, but hopefully this gives you a good overview of, of some of the recommendations. Uh, so from, from here, we, we see some of these options as being pursued through legislative actions at the Capitol. Um, others are going to be addressed through the authority of the Air Quality Control Commission. Um, they do have a placeholder in their calendar for, I think, July or August of 2021 to consider, um, you know, transportation rules um, that are in support of the greenhouse gas roadmap. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, we've we put in all this work on the, the inventory and the greenhouse gas roadmap, um, and we will need to be checking in regularly to see how all these actions are actually penciling out in terms of real world reductions. So, um, so the team at CDPHE is going to be responsible um, for ongoing tracking, for ongoing inventories, um, uh, and we'll be able to check in on that and, and adjust as necessary. Um, it is impossible to create a plan um, that lays out everything we need to do between now and 2050. So um, those regular check-ins with CDPHE uh, will be really useful in refining the strategy going forward. And that is all I have. Thank you, Kay. Uh, are there any questions for Kay from the uh, members of the TAC? Cam, yes, Mr. Go ahead. Yes, yes, Mr. Chair. We do have a couple. Uh, first, we have Brian Weimer. Um, so, Brian, when you're ready, please go ahead. Yes, I noticed that. Um, oh, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, good information. Uh, I noticed that you talk about TDM measures and particularly teleworking. So my question is, what have you or what are your specific strategies to leverage the social experiment that we've been going through the last eight months with uh, the pandemic and how that has really affected travel, at least at the beginning? And how might you be able to utilize that real life experience? example or have you talked about how you could use that real life example of the benefits that can be derived from that and how to leverage that that um, yeah that's a great question that we've gone through i guess yeah that that is a great question and this has been a big topic of conversation since march you know i think if you had asked anyone on the state team if we could think about you know maybe a 10 percent telework requirement you know back in january people would have been like "Ooh, that's very aggressive and then suddenly you know we went to 85 percent of folks teleworking overnight and we realized that you know they're really we can be pretty aggressive on that possibly um so I think we're watching it closely. Um, you know, I think in the early days of, of the pandemic, we were seeing VMT reductions, um, you know, ranging from 45 to 65 percent, depending on the roadway. Um, we have managed to maintain, um, you know, even as things have opened back up, we've managed to maintain, you know, I think we were maintaining around 12 or 15 percent through the summer. It might be more like 10 percent VMT reduction now. So, um, so yeah, I think you know there. There is, I think, more opportunity there than people would have thought a year ago. Um, and a piece of, you know, the the TDM requirements for large employers, um, you know, that would certainly include teleworking as an option, um, you know, among other options like taking transit or things. So um, it is interesting what um, how much the world has changed in that respect, and, and something that the team has been looking really closely at to see what we can, what behavior change we can um, we can continue into the future. Thank you. Cam, next person. Okay. Next, we have Phil Greenwald. Uh, Phil, when you're ready, please go ahead. Hi. Um, okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Much appreciated. Good, great information. 
Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to this over and over, uh, especially probably, probably through this meeting as well. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit and maybe get a little bit more information about your indirect source standards. Um, that slide where you talked about indirect source rules and implementation of this type of regulation. I'm just trying to figure out, are you trying to, is, are you seeing that there's going to be some regulation from the state that will um, kind of talk to locals about how we need to do land uses in the future or how, to, how does that look? Um, so I'll admit I'm, I'm not the expert on this. Um, CEPHE would be, would be leading this process, but um, I think, you know, maybe the best example would be, you know, a, possibly a, a new kind of um, warehouse facility or something that, that's going in and thinking about, okay, if you're, if you're putting in this warehouse, you know, the warehouse itself doesn't have emissions, but all, you know, the hundreds of trucks that might come to it every day and idle in that neighborhood does have an emissions impact. Um, so thinking about, you know, as you're building facilities like that, you know, can you do things like, you know, put in truck electrification, um, you know, if it's has refrigerated storage, can you put in, um, you know, the appropriate infrastructure so that those refrigerated trucks aren't idling for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours um, while they're waiting to offload and unload their cargo. Um, so, so really thinking about the mitigation measures um, and the, the traffic that things that buildings attract. Um, in addition to just looking at the building itself. Does that help at all? I think so. I'm just trying to figure out then who who takes on that regulation. Is it the builder of the warehouse or is it the city that is uh, overseeing the planning piece of that and trying to permit this? I'm assuming that the permits would be the driver of that. Yeah, and I think the Air Quality Control Commission would have to adopt something through rule, um, and there'd be direction in that as to, you know, how that would get implemented and monitored. Um, but I think CDPHE would have the, the lead role in um, granting those permits and monitoring them. Okay, thank you. Cam, do you have any additional hands raised? Yeah, yes, we do, Mr. Chair. Next, we have Alex Hyde-Wright. So Alex, when you're ready, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, I guess, could you confirm, I think I heard that we need a 90 cent, a 96% reduction in transportation sector emissions by 2050 to meet our greenhouse gas reductions target. Is, is that 96% reduction correct? That's correct. And then, as a as a follow up, has CDOT modeled or projected how much of that reduction could or should come from vehicle electrification versus reducing vehicle miles traveled? And my suspicion is that we'll need both in healthy portions. But I was wondering if CDOT's thought much about the balance between those two. Uh, we do need both. Um, you're correct. Um, I can't speak to kind of exact mix between the two. Um, but yeah, we can't get there with just electrification or just VMT. We we do need both. Um, so, but more more modeling to come on that um, as uh, as recommendations are developed. And then is is CDOT going to be doing that modeling, or is that the Energy Office, or what what are the next steps in terms of getting more definition to that strategy? Um, so a lot of that would be um, through CDOT. Um, and specifically through um, the Division of Planning and Development at CDOT. Um, so yes, thinking about um, how we would establish budgets for projects um, and, and make sure that we're tracking projects um, and that they're mitigating um, for any emissions that they're creating. Okay, thank you. Cam, do we have additional speakers? that we should ask questions or make comment? Yes, Catholic. we do. Yes, we do, Mr. Chair. Next, we have Richard Pilgrim. Uh, Richard, when you're ready, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Kelly. Terrific uh, presentation. Um, I think this kind of follows on the previous question. You mentioned uh, greenhouse gas budgets at, I think, at the planning area level and alluded to uh, uh, and I, I'm sure you don't have detail on this yet, but alluded to what I interpreted uh, would be evaluation of projects on that basis. Um, and 
and you also mentioned uh, the consideration at the, I think at the environmental permitting stage or, or the EIS stage would be important as well. Um, we, uh, at, uh, of course, at Dr. Cog or at, at an MPO, we deal often with um, with ranking projects and considering uh, weighting criteria like what I think would be implied here. Can you describe this a little bit more, uh, or is it still a little early to be thinking about ways that you might evaluate projects and, and what kind of weight you might add for a, a GHG component. Yeah, and thanks for that question. Um, and, and yeah, I think, you know, really the specifics of this have not been developed yet, but, you know, we do anticipate that there would be some conversations between CDPHE and CDOT um, and, you know, the major metro areas um, you know, especially, and I, and I think I, I mentioned this in the presentation, but, you know, we do do this already as part of conformity for ozone and for criteria pollutants. So, you know, we think that we would be starting a process like this um, with the, the MPOs that are already kind of engaged in conformity because um, they're more familiar with the process um, and, you know, you're located in our non-attainment areas, which are the areas where we, we need to kind of do an initial focus. Um, so, so more details to come, but, you know, really the basic idea is, you know, looking at projects through the greenhouse gas lens in addition to all the other lenses we look at them, you know, for, you know, with regard to, to air quality and ozone and, and um, you know, criteria pollutants. Well, good. I, just a, a final comment. I, I think that, uh, as, you, as you describe, the role for, um, for the MPOs to help in that process. I, I think that would be that'd be terrific. Uh, the Dr. Cog staff. Uh, there are some people who spent a number of years working on this kind of thing, and I think they could contribute a lot to that to that discussion and the eventual product. Absolutely, absolutely, and and we are planning and have already had some conversations um, with you know the the front range MPOs, and uh, so yeah, we're we're. Looking forward to digging into more details on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Cam, or is there additional people that would like to speak? Yes, Mr. Chair, we have Art Griffith next. So, Art, when you're ready, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, what role, I know this isn't related to transportation, but what role uh, do you all see as far as like solar for houses and and in the future and how soon do you think they'll start implementing more aggressive to reduce uh, dependency on energy um, fossil fuels by using solar panels and things like that. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I'll admit that buildings aren't my specific area of expertise, but you know I think I've I've been hearing about buildings in the same um, same way that I've been hearing about electric vehicles. So I'll, I'll maybe make a parallel there. So, you know, thinking about, you know, having a, a plan to have 100% of electric vehicle sales and light duty, you know, by a certain year, and then knowing that, you know, vehicles remain in the fleet for, you know, 12 or 15 years, you know, so we have 100% sales of light duty vehicles, you know, by this year, and then 10 or 15 years later, we can expect that the vast majority of the vehicle fleet, um, you know, nearly 100% um, could be electric. I think that's the same vision that they have for um, things like building electrification, um, things like, you know, electric heat pumps and solar and and wind and, and other things that, that power our homes, you know, thinking about, you know, after a certain point in time, you know, we wouldn't be building houses that connect to the natural gas grid. We would be building houses that that run off our electric grid, which is now, you know, upgraded and improved and, and not, you know, not using fossil sources, but using the renewable sources. That answer your question, or Yeah, thanks. I just have to unmute myself. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Cam, are a little bit outside my swim lane, but I tried my best. <laughs> Cam, are there additional uh, questions or comments? 
Right, hands raised. No, Mr. Chair, I don't see any more hands raised for questions or comments at this time. Are there any TAC members on the phone? If so, if you'll star six and, and go ahead and speak. Hearing none, um, uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, we'll move on to our next item. Um, our next item is an action item. It's a discussion of the uh, TIP COVID-19 impact options. And Todd, I believe you're the going to take this lead on this one. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So 2020, uh, it's been quite an interesting year. So I, I think not only has this impacted us personally, um, but it has also impacted you, the sponsor, for your TIP projects. So soon after you know, everything was shutting down, uh, this was something that staff also wondered, was you know, what was gonna be the impact to the local governments and your projects? Um, so earlier this year, um, Dr. Todd staff held discussions with each of the committees and the board, you know, presenting them with options on what items Dr. Todd could do to assist, um, which then turned into discussions with the affected forums over the last couple of months. Uh, these options presented to them you know, and, and attempts to remedy any of these COVID-19 related delays um, were agreeable to the forum and are outlined in the memo. Um, so these include three options. Um, the first is TIP project, or TIP policy project delay extension. Uh, this simply allows for a TIP policy variation to extend the time period for the project sponsors to initiate their project phases. So using a quick example, you know, if a project experienced a three-month delay due to COVID, they may be granted up to a three-month extension to initiate their project phases. So that deadline would essentially reset from October 1st to January 1st. Um, the delay would still appear within the annual project delays report, which will be coming up um, later this year. Um, but again, that, that deadline is just reset to January 1st. Um, if that phase is not a uh, initiated by January 1st, uh, the sponsor would still have until July 1st before that second year delay kicked in. And again, that would be with possible extensions beyond that if there are still some COVID-19 related delays and issues with that project. Um, something to point out that uh, part of the staff recommendation is that if any delay extension requests are approved for longer than eight months, uh, we will automatically move that funding year to the next year and, and go ahead and reprogram that. Um, the second option presented is, again, the, just a reprogramming of the federal funds. So this option allows project sponsors to request their Dr. Cog allocated funds be reprogrammed to another year without triggering a project delay penalty. Um, so quick example, if a, a funding had fund, if a project had funding in FY20 and it's approved to be moved into FY21, that project phase would also move. Um, the project phase would not be reviewed as part of the FY20 project delay cycle, again, coming up later this year, though it would still be noted in that, re in that project delays report. But instead, um, the actual delay would move and review, I should say, would move to the FY21 cycle. Um, the third option we split into kind of two different, different scenarios for the use of toll credits. Um, so just as a reminder, toll, the state toll credits replace local match, um, but do not provide funding to a project. So in one option, if the state toll credits were to be used, um, obviously you would need to reduce the project scope accordingly. So using a, another, another example, you have a million dollar project with 800,000 in Dr. Cog funds and a $200,000 local match. And of course, the toll credits would be applied because um, they would be unable to use the 200,000 in local match. Um, again, if, this to if the toll credits are applied successfully, um, the project would need to reduce that, that project scope by 200,000. Um, in the other example, so 3B, again, using the similar example of the, of the state toll credits, that 200,000 in local scope reduction would be backfilled using unallocated waiting list funds from Dr. Cog to make that uh, scope whole. So these are the three options that were presented. Um, 
And again, so that we um, have the three options in front of us, um, attachment one contains the projects that sponsors wished Dr. Cog to consider when looking at the project delays as being affected by COVID. Um, each request will be verified and discussed as we move forward um, through the project delays process and will be part of the delay considerations. Um, so with that, I will leave it right there for any comments or questions. Um, the action before you is to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee approval of the options available to the TIP projects impacted by COVID-19. Um, one thing I would just like to point out and make sure it's clear is that the projects that have requested the COVID relief, again, that, that's contained within attachment one, um, this is not part of the action that we're looking for this afternoon. The action that we're looking for simply is approval of those three options that are available to those have, that have made that request. So with that, I'd be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Thank you, Todd. Are there any uh, questions or comments? Uh, hands raised, Cat, Cam? No, Mr. Chair, uh, not at this time. I don't see any hands, hands raised. Okay. Um, if that's the case, uh, we'll now entertain a motion. Oh, and, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, let's go ahead. It, we did just have one hand get raised. Um, okay. Uh, Brian Weimer, when you're ready, please go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to put a motion on the table and that motion is to recommend to the RTC approval of the options that were presented by staff, those three options uh, for TIP projects impacted by 20 or by COVID 2019. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second? Uh, second, I raised my hand to second, Art Griffith. Thank you. Um, is there any additional discussion? Please raise your hand or uh, star six and we'll call on you. Cam, are there any additional hands raised? No, Mr. Chair, not at this time. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Cam, if you'll once again unmute the TAC members and alternates representing their members only uh, for a verbal vote. Aye. All those, in, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, all those opposed. By, signify by saying no. Any abstentions? The motion passes. We'll now move on to our uh, uh, Cam. If you'd please take a moment and mute everyone, I'd appreciate it. We'll next move on to our discussion of fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities for the 2050 Metro Vision uh, Regional Transportation Plan known as the 2050 MVRTP. I believe Jacob will, Rieger will be making a presentation on this and this is an action item. Go ahead, Jacob. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Um, can folks hear me and see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can, Jacob. Great, okay. All right, so um, this is a culmination of a lot of work by just about everyone on this phone call today. So we're gonna talk about our proposed, really recommended fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities for the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. So wanna have just a little bit of context for this conversation, kind of start us back at the beginning of our planning process um, over a year ago uh, with the pandemic, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, but we actually started with a lot of the things that we've been talking about already in this meeting today. Uh, we really started with the lens of our Metro Vision Plan um, and some of the specific factors that have already come up today around greenhouse gas emissions, um, non-single occupant vehicle travel to work, uh, vehicle miles traveled, and, and many of those other topics. You know, these are all things that are part and parcel of our Metro Vision Plan. Um, and specifically, you know, some of our numerical targets within Metro Vision of where this region wants to be um, you know, in the future. 
Um, and that was really sort of a foundational principle for uh, the beginning of our 2050 planning process, you know, as was without sort of starting on a negative note, but just the truism that, um, as has also been discussed today, that for a lot of these transportation related, um, you know, sort of targets or, or measures, you know, at least pre-pandemic, we weren't going in the direction of many of them that Metro Vision said that we wanted to go. And so how can the regional transportation plan, you know, best sort of implement and best support uh, the Metro Vision plan? Um, a few other things, uh, sort of our strategic focus in the 2050 planning process, in addition to helping to implement um, the Metro Vision Plan. Um, also a focus on our regional policy priorities. We talked a lot about this at our October 5th um, TAC meeting, but a really strong and intentional focus on safety, Vision Zero, um, again, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, regional transit, active transportation, freight, multimodal mobility, and some of these other sort of regional policy priorities that we've been talking about together as a group uh, for several months now. Um, another thing that's kind of new for us in the 2050 plan is an explicit programmatic investment uh, addressing policy priorities. Again, we talked a lot about that at our October 5th meeting. Um, emphasis on including multimodal projects, significant public and stakeholder engagement. Um, and we've talked about that throughout our planning process of some of the public engagement techniques and groups that we're pioneering as part of our 2050 process. And then regional collaboration for the region's transportation plan. Um, and we've really sort of emphasized that in this planning process. Uh, you know, we didn't have the county transportation forums uh, five, six years ago when we did the 2040 plan. Uh, the partnership between the regional agency, CDOT, Dr. Cog, RTD, um, has been really strong in this process. So that's also been a foundational element of the 2050 planning process. Um, some context to investment priorities, um, thinking about the fiscally constrained recommendations. Uh, federal Requirements 101, we need to individually identify regionally significant roadway and rapid transit capacity projects in the plan, and that relates to our federal air quality conformity requirements. We need to identify the implementation staging period for each of these major projects, which also relates to air quality conformity modeling. We need to demonstrate reasonable availability of revenues to fund the project and program investments, uh, which we've already talked about in this group, which is known in the federal term of fiscal constraint or cost feasibility. Uh, those are probably the main requirements, federal requirements for our conversation today, but you know, do take note that there's many other federal requirements in general for our metropolitan planning process relating to our long range transportation plan. Um, so just a little bit of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, we spent a lot of time both at the October 5th TAC meeting and previously talking about kind of the evaluation of the candidate projects that we received through our project solicitation and evaluation process over the summer. Um, so today we're kind of in the middle box of determining priorities, um, the work of the interagency process of the three regional agencies, recommending specific project and program investment priorities, the topic of today's meeting. Um, and then once we um, attain board approval, um, you know, TAC and RTC recommendation and board approval of those investment priorities, where we're going in the planning process is to conduct air quality conformity modeling and then actually putting the draft 2050 plan document uh, together. We are aiming for a draft plan ready for public and stakeholder review in early 2021. Um, and that's in large part ultimately to meet our federal deadline of having the feds, FHWA and FTA review and certify the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, which they need to do under federal law by June 27th, 2021. Uh, just a little bit more context here. Again, this is something we've seen before, but just thinking back to our framework, um, all the great work that has been done at the local level, uh, local governments, county governments, um, our three regional agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, uh, some of the things that we're now hearing about at the state level, such as what we've talked about today with House Bill 1261, uh, some of the federal uh, sort of requirements and, and things at the federal level that we keep in mind in this process as well. The point here is that you put all of these things together and they really do collectively sort of define our vision and define our framework uh, for the 2050 planning process. Um, in addition to all of those things, um, we've had some additional input through uh, the work that we've done together. Uh, we also talked about this at the October 5th TAC meeting. Um, that memo in particular, as well as this memo for today's meeting, linked to all of these things. So I'm not going to go through them individually, but it's more just a transparency of, you know, here were the things uh, that we've taken in through the planning process that have been important inputs to getting us to where we are today. 
So as we work through our interagency uh, process with the three regional agencies to actually reach fiscal constraint on the recommended project and program priorities we're bringing you today, um, there were some considerations that we used in that process that we wanted to share with you in terms of how that work was conducted. Um, so first we were looking, of course, for multimodal projects that were consistent with the priority programs investment strategy uh, that we talked about at October 5th TAC. Uh, planning project development status of a candidate project or corridor uh, was a consideration, uh, particularly in terms of staging and some of the input that we got uh, from the project submitter in terms of staging of that, you know, those projects. Um, obviously, we're looking for projects with regional benefit, you know, can be hard to define, but clearly we, you know, with the limited financial resources of the three agencies, we obviously want to maximize those investments. Um, combining projects, and this could mean, you know, in some cases we did get through the candidate project process, we did get you know, a couple or more versions of, of kind of similar projects. Um, in some cases, as we think about sort of building out a system and putting a network together, um, you know, combining, you know, maybe projects that are geographically adjacent. Uh, so that was part of the calculus. Uh, county forums candidate project rankings were really important. And I think you'll see that uh, kind of in the attachments in terms of the recommended projects, as well as the priorities of the regional agencies um, through the process that we've um, described at previous meetings. Um, that, you know, those things that were important as well and some of the things we've already covered both in this meeting and in this presentation. And then finally, geographic balance is obviously a very important, um, you know, very important consideration for um, all of us. And we heard that through our regional evaluation panel um, and we heard that through other channels. And I think that's also reflected um, in the recommended project and program investment priorities. So specifically talking about fiscal constraint, um, again, it's really two things. At October 5th TAC, we talked about the program investment priorities, and I have a reminder slide coming up on that. Um, today, we're adding those individual major uh, sort of projects that are part of that. Uh, we've also talked in previous meetings about the carryover projects from the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, that's part of the investment strategy as well and part of fiscal constraint. A um, couple notes on those projects just for sort of clarification. Um, there are projects that we're bringing over from 2040, and, and if you'll recall, um, the sort of the idea of these projects is that they're far enough along in the project development process. They're funded in the TIP. Um, they are going through a NEPA process or recently completed a NEPA process. You know, projects that in whatever way are far enough along that we wanted to automatically bring them forward into 2050. Some of those projects are projects where they're not quite far enough along that they're sort of under construction just yet. So they're projects that, you know, have a project cost that became part of the fiscal constraint work that we needed to do for the 2050 plan. There are some other projects that we're bringing forward from 2040 that are under construction, nearly completed. Those projects in attachment one and attachment two were showing a sort of a zero cost. Obviously, there's not a zero cost to those projects. What that means is that in terms of you know, sort of the fiscal constraint or the financial accounting of those projects, uh, that the costs and the revenues for those projects have been spoken for. We're actually showing those projects as part of 2050, maybe because they are under construction, haven't opened the traffic yet. They're part of our air quality conformity network, uh, part of the planning network for the period of this plan. Um, today, we're really focusing on the new uh, regionally funded projects or the recommended fiscally constrained projects. And then we'll also talk a little bit about locally funded projects for this plan. Um, so again, I've mentioned our priority investment program strategy. We spent a lot of time on this at the October 5th TAC meeting. Um, so just a quick reminder here that this was the programmatic element that we wanted to recognize sort of the regional policy priorities and intentionally show revenues within fiscal constraint through the 30 year plan period um, towards these policy priorities. One of the things that we did hear from uh, this group from TAC at your October 5th meeting was the importance of freight. And we've actually added a freight um, sort of program as part of uh, the priority investment program strategy with some associated project, uh, projects that are shown in attachment one. Uh, digging in a little more detail on fiscal constraint, uh, project and program investments. Um, you know, we talked about sort of geographic ed equity, regional equity. So the chart on the right shows all of the funding proposed for fiscal constraint in terms of projects and programs, um, as well as the carryover projects from 2040, kind of showing how that shook out on a countywide basis. Um, again, we're not you know, it's, it's hard to get to exact sort of parity and it's hard to think about, you know, there's many different ways that you can define equity um, in this type of analysis in terms of what was requested, um, you know, what was what was finally allocated in fiscal constraint, 
you know, the proportion of what was requested to what was actually received. There's many ways to slice this, but we did want to show kind of at the at the regional level by county kind of how that shook out. It does include project funding from all three regional agencies. Um, as noted, it also includes the region-wide programmatic funding, as well as the carryover projects from the 2040 plan. Um, and that several projects do span multiple counties. We tried to account for that. Um, as well as some of the carryover projects from the 2040 plan. There are a few really big sort of carryover projects that frankly are, are you know, influencing this analysis a little bit as well. But still, we wanted to show these numbers uh, to be transparent in the work. We also wanted to show funding allocation by project and program type. Again, this can also get a little bit difficult because one of the foundational principles here is that we're trying to you know, have sort of double or triple bottom lines. We're trying to leverage you know, projects that do multiple things. Um, it's something that we've heard from you. It's something that we heard from the regional evaluation panel. So you can have a transit project that contributes to safety. You can have a project X that also has a, you know, a Y outcome, so to speak. Um, but even so, we wanted to try and show the breakdown at a high level of the types of sort of investments that we're proposing to fund uh, through the project and program investment priorities in the 2050 plan. Um, I will say when you think about the 137 candidate projects we received, through our planning process and the recommended fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities, I, I do think that it's a very multimodal, very diverse, um, you know, sort of set of investments more than I think we've had in some time. Um, and I think we are trying to honor the policy priorities that are contained in the Metro Vision Plan, um, in our regional framework, and some of the other things that we've been talking about uh, here today. Uh, finally, a couple more things to consider in terms of staging periods. Um, as I said earlier, it is a federal requirement. We do need to perform air quality conformity analysis by air quality staging periods. Um, those are shown in attachment one. We also need to demonstrate reasonable distribution of project costs and revenues um, by fiscal constraint funding tiers. This is a federal requirement that basically says, you know, the plan needs to be roughly balanced um, over the 30 year planning horizon. Um, yes, we all want our projects sort of as soon as possible, but you know, this is a 30 year plan. We need to show some regional distribution of those projects and the revenues associated with those projects um, over the life of the plan. Um, finally, for transparency in the bottom bullet here, based on final fiscal constraint analysis, we are asking for some limited discretion to work with project sponsors as needed to adjust project staging um, as we go through this process. Also, the locally funded projects, um, these were carried over from the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan with two rounds of sponsor modifications, one that was relatively recent and one that we did at the beginning of the planning process. The locally funded projects, so these are projects that are funded you know, without sort of regional funds. These are projects that are funded directly by kind of a local project sponsor. It can include several ways of funding the project, but the point is that there are local funds controlled by, by the sponsor of the project. Those include toll highway authority projects, specifically E-470, Northwest Parkway, and Jefferson Parkway, and we've reached out and are working with all three of, of those toll highway authorities. Um, regional funding recommendations may modify proposed locally funded project lists. Um, so again, we are asking for some limited discretion after this is adopted by the board to go back to project sponsors to sort of, um, you know, sort of finalize uh, the locally funded list based on actions taken on sort of the regionally funded projects. So next steps today, we are asking for your recommended approval of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Fiscally Constrained Project and Program Investment Priorities. Um, we will take this to our board in a work session format on November 4th. Um, and then formally, we will take it to our Regional Transportation Committee um, and to our board for their review and action at their November meetings. So uh, with that, we do have one kind of, or one set of kind of late breaking um, amendments to kind of what we're showing is the recommended list of projects in attachment one. Um, I would ask Jordan Rudel from CDOT um, to speak to this slide. Jordan. Hi, uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple um, items here that we want to um, recommend for uh, propose amendments um, on projects in the 2050 Metro Vision Plan that will proceed to the the board work session RTC and then and then the Dr. Cog board ultimately. Um, the first one here is a project to be added, which is a C470 managed lane project from Wadsworth to I70. This is a project uh, that we um, feel strongly that um, you know through 2050 
has a lot of potential um, to uh, to be completed. Um, the dollar amounts there would be 360 million plus 200 uh, million of toll revenue. <clears throat> the second amendment that CDOT is requesting is uh, a caller uh, dollar cost adjustment on I-25 Valley Highway. Um, originally listed and proposed in our first draft at 1 billion, uh, moving that to 900 million. And uh, the amendments here listed before everyone today, you know, importantly uh, allows um, CDOT to retain important investment priorities along each of these corridors and and also help um, with funding towards our regional safety and, and air quality interagency priorities. Thank you, Jordan, appreciate that. And so with that, before I get to our requested motion for this item, I just wanna take one last opportunity to thank sort of everyone, both you know staff at Dr. Cog, all the hard work that our staff has put into this, um, the collaboration with our regional agencies, uh, CDOT and RTD, and especially the collaboration that we've had with all of you at the local government level with the county transportation forums. It's been a lot of work, as I said at the beginning, by a lot of folks uh, to get to this point in the process. So really appreciate the collaboration. Asking for the motion that you see here, which is to move to move to recommend to RTC the 2050 RTP fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities with the proposed amendments that we just covered. And with that, Mr. Chair, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob and, um, and Jordan. Are there any questions or comments um, for uh, from TAC members for for Jacob? And if so, please raise your hand and uh, Cam will call on you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, we have Art Griffith. Art, when you're ready, uh, go ahead. So the only proposed amendment was the one that Jordan just went over with the two CDOT projects at 470 and Barnum Yard. That's correct, Art. Then um, going back to the motion, I, I would make a motion in support of this. Okay. There's, it's, it's been um, moved um, by Art and Cam, do we have a second? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brian Weimer, when you're ready, please go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, I'll second that, but I do have a uh, question as well. Okay, it's been moved and seconded and uh, discussion and Brian will let you go first and then raise your hand if you uh, have further discussion items on it from TAC members, thank you. Okay, so this, this question is for Jacob and uh, when I look at your slide 11 versus attachment um, two in the uh, handout, I notice that there's a difference in terms of total allocation um, so my question is, I assume that's associated with projects or corridors that are going between counties, is that correct? And if so, how did you make those allocations? Because I noticed that some gone up, some went down. I'm curious about that. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Let me try to answer that. I'll ask Alvin to help me as well. Um, so a couple of things here. So I'm back on, I think, the slide that Brian's referring to on slide 11 of the allocations by county. So yes, um, on the projects that sort of spanned multiple counties, and we did have many of those projects, we generally tried to uh, sort of allocate those between counties. I'll admit it wasn't precise. We didn't do like a per mile cost by any means, but we did try to recognize that if a project was in two counties, let's say that we tried to make that, um, you know, we tried to make that adjustment. Um, one of the differences may be between sort of, um, you know, just the actual fiscally constrained projects that we're showing versus the projects and the program investment priorities, which is what this slide is showing. Um, but with that, Alvin, I'm going to ask you to clarify or correct anything I just said on that. Hey, Jacob, that's correct. So slide 11, what you're also seeing is just regional funding. So that's just the funding from the regional agencies of Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. Uh, when you get to the actual tables on attachment one and two, we're also starting to assume some local contributions for projects. So that might be why there's some discrepancy between the total numbers 
Uh, in addition to the counties, um, like Jacob mentioned, we did try to split projects as we could. So if a project spanned three counties, we just split the project money three counties, as you're seeing in this table. When it came to assembling attachment two, we just moved that project fully into that county to show to show that line item within the county. So you'll see a full project cost versus what we're doing here in site 11, which is splitting cost amongst counties. Yeah, and I think maybe one more difference. Okay, yeah, Brian, just to be transparent, I think one more difference here might be as well, Alvin, correct me if I'm wrong, but this table on slide 11 does include the carryover projects from 2040. And in this instance, in carrying those projects over, we did carry over the full cost on those projects. Whereas, as I said, what we're actually showing for recommended uh, fiscally constrained projects, some of those projects are far enough along that from a federal perspective, those costs have been accounted for. But again, in this table, I think we showed those full costs to sort of give that credit um, to those carryover projects. Is that correct, Alvin? Yep, that's correct, Jacob. Okay, so that may be one additional difference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Brian, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks for the clarifications. Thank you. Cam, are there any additional uh, hands raised? Yes, there are, Mr. Chair. Next, we have uh, Gene Sanson. So, Gene, when you're ready, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, Gene Sanson, City of Boulder. Thank you, Jacob, and, and all of Dr. Chicago staff for your great work in putting together this draft list. It's really impressive. And I agree that um, this is really going in a wonderful direction where we see more of a balanced approach to multimodal investments. So, thank you for that. Um, my question is related to um, the first presentation we saw um, from the state related to the THG um, reduction roadmap and the draft 2050 um, investment program. It seems like this is a fabulous opportunity for us to look at how this list, list in attachment one, gets us to those really aggressive targeted reductions of 96% from the transportation sector. Um, so, you know, just recognizing that this is a really solid list, but, you know, encouraging Dr. Cog to take the lead to create these performance measures or benchmarks for us to start to see um, just how this list will start getting us towards those GHG reduction goals. So I guess I would say I would encourage us to um, think about um, taking the lead from a regional standpoint. Um, in coordination with the state and our partners to evaluate this list and, and start looking at things like a GHG budget and checking in on this list because the timing seems ideal. Thank you, Jean. Okay, thank you, Jean. Jacob, do you have any response? Um, yeah, I'll just say, uh, Jean, thanks for the comment. Appreciate it very much. Um, as I said at the beginning, you know, even before House Bill 1261, some of the foundational things contained in House Bill 1261 really were already part of our Metro Vision process and by extension, um, part of our 2050 planning process. You know, a 2050 plan or really any long range transportation plan is a snapshot in time. Um, and in this planning process, not just 1261, but, you know, regional vision zero, reimagine, there's been a lot of things going on that we are trying as best we can to incorporate as much as we can now. Um, and we'll continue to do so as we go forward. Um, but as we shift to putting the plan document together, um, assembling sort of some of these you know, components of the 2050 plan, um, we will do as much as we can on all these topics to include them as part of the overall plan. Thank you. Um, Cam, are there additional comments or questions, hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. Next, we have uh, Art Griffith. So Art, you know, please go ahead. If you could go back to that slide 11. <clears throat> I just have a couple of questions, um, but we'll start there. So um, when I was looking through the, the list in the packet, I noticed that um, State Highway 83, $150 million appeared in the Arapahoe County list and the same 150 million for State Highway 83 in Douglas County. And I'm wondering that in this table of uh, that shows the amounts in Arapahoe and Douglas County, 
was that 180 million split or did these numbers in this table just include 180 million um, total in, in both counties? That's my first question. Yeah, thanks, Art. So I think, um, and again, Alvin, correct me if I say this wrong, but in the table you're seeing on slide 11, again, with these projects that span multiple counties, we did try at some level to sort of account for that. Um, again, admittedly, not super precise. We didn't do a per mile, you know, sort of calculation or anything like that. But if a project was in multiple counties, we did try to, to, try to at least split that cost. Um, in attachment two, I think it is, it's showing the projects by county. Yes, we're repeating the projects there. We're not attempting to, again, you know, split the cost by county. What we're trying to communicate there is that if there's a project that was in your county, regardless of whether it also, you know, bled into other counties, if it was at least partially in your county, we wanted to show that as part of the list of projects in your county. Yeah, you just clarified my statement for me, but particularly on this slide, if I was to to be asked <laughs> my question about the state highway 83 150 million does the 830 in douglas county include how much of that 150 million if any um it does include it in alvin can you yeah, yeah i can go alvin, and answer that so for that project specifically uh, since it did span two counties we just split the total cost into so there is money going into both Douglas and Arapaho in this table while attachment two shows that full project cost. Thank you. And then the next slide. Um, is the where's bike and peds in there? I mean, like a lot of our projects, I don't care if they're a, a roadway or an interchange, we there are a lot of costs to improve multimodal improvements. So what would what would this where would the bike and peds be? Are they all in that 13% multimodal arterial roadways? Yes. Uh, well, Alvin, sorry, did you want to go ahead and answer that one? Oh, you can go ahead, Jacob. So specifically, Art, um, for the uh, for bike and ped projects, they're specifically in the safety and active transportation and freight, uh, one, the 10 percent there. Um, but you're right. They also show up in the multimodal arterial roadways. And that's what I said in presenting this, that, you know, it's hard to sort of stratify these into distinct buckets because the whole point was that, you know, we're looking for sort of these projects that do multiple things. And many of the roadway projects do have, you know, multimodal components in terms of either bike, ped or transit. Um, or even safety elements to them, um, but we at least wanted to give a rough sense of how uh, how the proposed project investments uh, kind of broke out on a scale like this. Yeah, I just I I think that's important to communicate to the board and moving forward. And you know, our US 85 project is a good example where we're recipient of 26 million in federal funds, and the project's uh, much more expensive than that um, with a lot of overmatch from the local agency but we have anywhere around 18 million dollars of that going into bike pad improvements so um, i didn't want people to forget that you know in, in these types of project decisions and encourage um, more and more of that and i and i think that's even true when we look at improving transit through interchanges for improved queue jumps and other things like that. Yep, good point, Art, thank you. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Art. Cam, are there additional hands raised? Uh, yes, there are. Next, we have uh, Phil Greenwald. So Phil, when you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, and Jacob, I'll just echo the, the the thanks for putting this all together. We know you went through a lot of a lot of work, and we saw you at a lot of meetings. And I really appreciate all the time you spent on this and and the product that was put out. Um, and kind of to Art's point, you know, the idea that there are some of these that are going to be, you know, multimodal or multimodal and and um, take care of some of the issues that we have for bikes and peds and for transit. But when I look at the list, I mean, I see a lot of the word, you know, widening, two to four lanes, 
four to six lanes, et cetera, et cetera. But just wondering if you can kind of talk me through and maybe um, assuage some of my fears here is that the, 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 the plan that we end up with will certainly go through some of that process where we go through and and I think Gene mentioned it before too, we make sure that the greenhouse gas piece is addressed as far as target goals. And that we also talked about, you know, when I see the roadway widenings, uh, I think about all the work, all the hard work that, Vis or that Dr. Cog has put together on Vision Zero. And so this concerns me as well, as far as how is this 2050 plan going to address those project goals as well? And then uh, finally, you guys do a lot of work on the, scenario planning so i'm hoping that the the work that was put into that and and some of the outcomes of that are going to be kind of used when you get to the final evaluation or, or go through the evaluation get to the final product of the 2050 plans can, can you elaborate a little bit more on that process and how those different things will be addressed i know it's a lot so i apologize yeah no worries phil you did cover a lot of ground let me start a response and then maybe ask uh, ron to uh, to jump in as well. Um, but first, let me kind of start with the projects that, that were submitted, thinking back to the 137 candidate projects. Again, I want to make the point that's really a credit um, to all of you at the local government level, the county transportation forums, the way you all work together. You know, truly and honestly, in my time at Dr. Cog, the set of projects that we received, the candidate projects, really were um, kind of the most diverse set of projects that we've evaluated uh, for a long-range plan in terms of, you know, we didn't get a lot of single you know, single focus projects. So again, even some of these roadway capacity projects, and we are a diverse region, and that's something that the regional evaluation panel did ask us to keep in mind. Not every project, not every county, not every place is situated uh, similarly. We all have different needs. We're all in kind of different places in our evolution. But, you know, even some of the roadway capacity projects do have a really strong sort of bike pad transit safety component with them. We got a lot of transit projects. You know, we're proposing, as we talked about on October 5th, you know, a regional BRT network, uh, building on the good work that RTD has, to, has done. Uh, we'll be including um, an intentional, you know, sort of programmatic element for safety, as well as, um, you know, several safety projects that were submitted through this process, as well as bringing in the work that we just completed on, on the regional Vision Zero plan, the high injury network, the critical corridors, and so on. So I could keep elaborating in that sense, but I guess the point is that we are trying to be intentional on all of these multimodal all of these priority goals in terms of reflecting both in terms of projects, programmatic elements, um, and other things that we're doing as part of putting the plan together. Uh, Ron, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I appreciate that, Jacob. Thank you. Jacob's, Jacob's absolutely right. Um, I think we, you know, we all came into the development of these investment priorities, which again, is an important part of the plan, but does not is is not by itself the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, but it is a, a foundational element. And um, I'm personally quite proud of the work that um, all of the agencies, the member jurisdictions, our partner regional agencies, and Dr. Cog staff did to come up with this recommendation. It represents, um, I'd say, an unprecedented level of investment of. Dr. Cog directed uh, funds over the next 30 years on things that we've identified as important um, to achieving regional transportation outcomes, um, including um, eliminating transportation related fatalities in this region, uh, making the transportation system more multimodal and uh, uh, more safely accommodating bicyclists and pedestrians in the system. Um, and, um, and, 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 starting to build out a regional bus rapid transit system uh, for this region, uh, which which I think is is a real game changer in terms of the region's transportation system. And that took a lot of partnership with a lot of folks around the region. Um, I, I think since it's come up a couple of times here and since it's come up in the public comments um, earlier in the meeting, um, you know, Dr. Cog has a performance measure and a target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions related to surface transportation. Um, that is an important thing, um, but it uh, probably is not, it's not as aggressive as the House Bill 1261 um, goals that have been set by the legislature. We will be doing an analysis as part of the air quality conformity. We'll also do an analysis of sort of how these investment priorities move us towards uh, the MetroVision targets and, and transportation related outcomes. At the same time, 
Um, as you heard as part of the greenhouse gas emissions roadmap um, discussion earlier, uh, there's still a lot of work to, to do in terms of rulemaking. We're not expecting to have any uh, rulemaking completed until mid-year next year. That's several months after when we need to adopt this 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, so we're not in a position to be able to delay action on this investment priority list now. Um, we will do another major update of this plan in another four years. We'll know more about sort of where we're headed. And, and, and finally, keep in mind that these investment priorities and these specific projects and programs is not the only way that we will um, pers that we will be able to achieve the greenhouse gas reductions uh, to meet those targets by 2050. Uh, as you heard very clearly uh, from Kay, the you know electrifying the vehicle fleet is first and foremost um, the most significant way we're going to reduce air pollution emissions related to vehicle travel in this region. It's not the only thing but it is certainly the most significant thing uh, we can do. Um, and land use plays a really important role. And um, you know, what, 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 what we're cognizant of is making sure that we're making good transportation investment decisions now to help support the kinds of land use changes over time that combined um, will, will also contribute to helping us achieve our air quality and our greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction targets however that rulemaking ends up. But right now we need to move forward with this. We're, we're proud of the work that's been done uh, with all of you and all the partners and feel really good about this. I think the unfortunate thing with slide 12 is, um, as everyone has alluded to, there's not a perfect way to sort of assess this. Nearly every project on this list has some multimodal component, but we did wanna call out and highlight the very specific investments that we're proposing as part of this plan on multimodal safety improvements on arterials, uh, on safety and active transportation investments in the region. Thanks, Ron, Thank I you. appreciate that. Um, just, I'd wonder if Art and uh, Brian would be willing for a friendly amendment just to acknowledge that Greenhouse and Vision Zero goals will play a significant role in these priorities at the end of the motion. And we could, you know, tell our RTC members and our board members, or that would show them at least that we were acknowledging that and bringing it into the the discussion and it, it was a concern that we uh we need to address at you know through the process hey, phil this is this is ron um can i just ask for a quick clarification in terms of what you're trying to achieve with that um that has take that has been accounted for and taken into and strongly taken into account in terms of putting this package together that's before you today Absolutely. I just want to. I just want to recognize that that's in that in the package. It's it's just not clear from the proposed motion that all that work has been done for these things. And I I think it's important, especially for our elected officials and our board members who sit on the elected officials that sit on the board, to know that we've that all this work has been put in, and it's not just interstates, freeways, uh, you know, that are the only thing that are going into this project. That there's there's a there's a broader there's broader work that's been done, and we need to acknowledge that and let the folks let, let folks know that. And I think it'll go a long way in moving this forward through the process. Yeah, Phil, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the acknowledgement. Um, I, I agree with you. I wonder if we could, if 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 it's okay to reflect that as a matter of the record, and we'll report that to the board rather than sort of putting in the motion. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, as long as it's acknowledged and and shown. But right. I think putting it in the motion does more for you but i i acknowledge that you uh that it, it extends the motion out to be quite complicated so yeah thank I, you. I will draw my uh my friendly amendment thank you phil are there additional speakers cam uh yes mr chair there is indeed next we have alex hyde wright so alex please go ahead thank you um, thank you, Ron and Jacob and all the other Dr. Cog staff who have spent so much time and work putting together this investment priority. Um, it's it's really great to see um, some of these investments um, in transit and safety and the active transportation. Um, Ron, I wanted to follow up on part of your answer to Phil's question. Um, I think you said that Dr. Cog will be doing some modeling or analysis to look at how this investment priority either moves us or does not move us towards the Metro Vision goals and objectives. 
Um, and in particular, um, kind of interested in the three that Jacob highlighted that we're not meeting right now, um, the SOV mode share, BMT per capita and traffic fatalities. So I guess I was wondering if you could provide a little more background on how Dr. Cog is gonna be looking at the investment priorities and the Metro Vision goals and reconciling how these move us hopefully in the right direction, um, move the needle in the right direction for those different Metro Vision objectives. Yeah, thank, thank you, Alex, for the question. Um, as you are probably aware, some of those are sort of easier to reflect and discern from sort of a regional travel model perspective, um, although even some of those imperfectly, and some of those like uh, traffic fatalities, transportation-related fatalities, um, we can't really model, we can't really predict, right? Well, this set of investments will, will definitely accomplish vision zero by 2035, right? We can't, we can't precisely say that, um, but I think we can correlate sort of the, the level of investment we're making and make the case very strongly that we're, that we're um, gonna make a difference towards that goal. Some of the others we can actually model outcomes like like VMT and VMT per cap per capita and, and emissions. Um, so those things that we can do a specific analysis of, we definitely want to report sort of what this plan is doing to uh, towards us achieving achieving those outcomes that have been identified and articulated through MetroVision. Uh, but again, everyone needs to recognize that you know those are forecasting models. They're not perfect. Uh, they're not exactly predictors. Um, but they're good indicators about kind of tying the decisions we make in a in a plan plan context to the outcomes we're aiming for. And is that work going to be completed and available to the board before MetroVision in its entirety is adopted? It will. All of that will be available before the MetroVision RTP is adopted um, in the spring of next year. And then one last follow-up question: um, If we continue to miss the mark on some of our MetroVision objectives. What are the opportunities or mechanisms to course correct on those? As I as I as I indicated before, uh, we do a major plan amendment every four years. Uh, we also we also uh, do plan amendments uh, uh, kind of more regularly, about annually. Um, so you know, as as we learn more from the greenhouse gas emissions roadmap work and the rulemaking and any additional legislation, as we know more about sort of investments uh, at the federal level and resources available to us for investments, uh, we continually learn and adjust the plan uh, within the context of the long range, uh, long range outcomes we're aiming for. Okay. Thank you. Kim. Are there additional uh, hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, next, we have Elaine Yazi. So, Elaine, when you're ready, please go ahead. Hi, this is Elaine Yazi with Denver. Just want to um, reiterate a lot of what people have already said. Thank you to Dr. Cog, staff, and all of us on the call that have um, really put forth a, a competitive and also a very thoughtful analysis and project list. I do have a couple questions. Um, one is looking at the active transportation program that's proposed. Um, so this is kind of one of my, and I recognize we've got the regional BRT program, the quarter transit, the arterial safety regional vision zone. Then we get down to the active transportation projects and programs. So that the program bucket, um, which is kind of that set aside, it's hovering at $31 million. And I know, and I and I totally know that we're not, I, I don't like doing a quick calculation and saying, well, that leaves a million dollars a year. Cause that doesn't really show the whole picture. But I I did do that. <laughs> that kind of sets that aside for like a million dollars a year um, to support these short trip opportunity zones. And um, I think one of the questions, and, and I know, and I recognize Denver has uh, two large projects that are called out in that specific category. You know, I'm wondering if there's some work um, I can Denver can do um, with the region to lower the amounts of dollars for the two specific projects and possibly expand the bucket a bit more. Just because I know how critical some sidewalks can be and transit and, and connections to transit and as well as bike improvements too. Um, 
And I just don't see, you know, setting about a million dollars aside a year um, helping out that much in the region. I don't want to sound like Debbie Downer, but uh, can I work with you guys a little bit more on maybe redefining some of our uh, the, the two projects in this list? Yeah, so I mean, this is Jake. I appreciate your comments and, and offer to work together. I think the way I'd answer that is just sort of, um, you know, kind of keeping high level, you know, appreciate where you're coming from and, and the importance on, on this topic, which is what we're all trying to reflect here. Um, I, I think I'd caution us all not to get too caught up in, you know, sort of the amount dedicated to a program versus the projects within a program. The point that we're trying to communicate here is that we are trying to intentionally set aside in the plan you know, sort of buckets of dollars that would be used programmatically over time in the plan to further, you know, these goals, in this case, active transportation or further these policy priorities. We're trying to get a start on that by identifying some of the projects that have come through either, you know, the candidate project process of the 137 candidate projects or, um, you know, some of the other projects that have come through, like say for Main Streets, for example, when that gets completed, you know, that's one good example of a good start on a safety program. So, yeah, we can certainly work with you on the cost of individual projects. I think I would just caution that it's not a zero sum game in terms of that's the only amount, you know, that you see on the screen here that we can spend on active transportation in the context of the 20, 2050 plan. There are a lot of other programmatic things that go into the plan, whether it's in the financial plan or even just in the work that we all do together that furthers all of these goals, but specifically related to active transportation. Remember that the final financial plan, you know, will include things like asset management and state of good repair, you know, local intersection work, kind of, you know, local sort of local collector, residential street, you know, sort of investments. I mean, all of those things and more are things that help contribute towards active transportation and some of these other policy priorities, not necessarily captured here in this sort of big picture program bucket, but things that come together in the plan to further further those things. So yes, we're certainly willing to work with you on a couple of projects, but I think the larger point is that, um, you know, there's money here and there will be money and other action through the course of the plan to do the things that we're trying to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions. One is um, related to the BRT, the regional BRT network. So like, again, I understand the caution on the dollar amounts and kind of looking at the specific projects. I'm wondering though, um, cause there's a, and this includes Denver projects and projects in Boulder and Adams County and Weld County. One of my questions is, did we collectively um, use the RTD BRT feasibility study for the costs that we've listed in here or the budget amounts that we've listed in here? Or is it a variety of different inputs? Because I just, I'm just trying to get a gauge if there was of, of what we all used for our inputs. And I mean, I can speak to Denver's, but just trying to think of Adams and Boulder Weld counties and then the bus maintenance facility. Yeah. So short answer here is in general, I believe, yes, we did. Um, I know we did use the PRT regional feasibility study. There were a couple of cases, so I'll offer Colfax, the original East Colfax BRT project and the State Highway 119 BRT project that, um, as you know and others know, are in sort of separate planning efforts where they did generate um, kind of more up-to-date costs that we're trying to reflect in the plan. But in general, on some of these corridors where we didn't otherwise have that planning work, um, yes, we are using the RTD uh, feasibility study is, is part of that. Again, planning level cost estimate, which we know will change over the course of 30 years. Okay. Um, and then one one other question, and this one's more specific to um, a CDOT project that's listed in Arapahoe County that does um, connect into Denver, is I-25 in Bellevue. Um, it's listed on the, the list of projects in the CDOT area. It has a target of 119 million, and I'm wondering um, if CDOT or someone can talk about um, if it does include the union connection into Denver or if it's just at Bellevue. Yeah, so may, I'll maybe ask CDOT staff to respond to that if they can. And I can always get clarification too after this meeting if if uh, 
if that needs to be clarified afterward. Hi, this is Jordan. There you go. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, Eileen. Um, we may have to do a little bit, you know, a follow up here after the fact on, on some of the deeper dive details of what it does or doesn't include. Uh, we had a cost estimate, and I'm, I'm kind of going off of memory, I think around 112 million um, that was really focused on the, the conclusions that would come out of the study that's ongoing right now. And, you know, my understanding is there's still some work to be, um, to be had in, involved in that study. And, and that's about the extent of, I think, what I can answer for that particular project right now. Okay, thank you. This is, sorry, Mr. Chair, if I could interject a little bit. This is Ron Papstorf again. I, yes. I think this is, a, this is a good opportunity just to remind everyone that, you know, the RTP is a planning document. These are planning level cost estimates for planning purposes. This is not a budget document. Costs get refined through uh, specific project planning efforts, through uh, NEPA work, uh, through design and project development work. So again, we, we, we're we going to do a final review of, of kind of cost estimates and refinement of cost estimate as part of the development of the, of the final RTP. Uh, but I, I just want to remind everyone these are planning level estimates in in the context of a 30-year plan this is not a this is not a budget document it's an important distinction to keep in mind thank you Ron for the reminder cam are there additional hands raised yes mr. chair next we have John cotton uh, John when you're ready please go ahead thank you um, and I do want to I do want to thank dr. cog and all those people who were involved in putting this plan together. I know it was a lot of work, um, but I still have some concerns uh, that, that were raised at the last meeting about the investment priorities, um, specifically uh, discouraging capacity projects. Um, I think we need to understand that those capacity projects do affect both safety and air quality. And uh, it seems, um, you know, I think it seems apparent when you look at the, the two biggest projects in the last uh, group and the, the ones we're looking at in the next group are the uh, the GAP project and then the central I-25 corridor, which are both capacity projects. So I, I, I am concerned about discouraging that, particularly when, you know, we look at uh, Douglas County and I'm sure some of those northern counties as well. I can tell you for Douglas County that uh, Elbert and El Paso counties create a good deal of that capacity uh, concern. And when we don't move those vehicles, we have more air, con uh, more air quality issues and more congestion and, and more greenhouse gases as a result of it. Um, and so I, you know, I, I just like to reiterate that. Also, I'm a little concerned about us putting, you know, a lot of our eggs in the basket of um, BRT when we have an RTD that, and I understand that they're working to try to resolve their issues, but but basically can't fund the current services and they're reducing those services. Uh, so to, to add additional services, um, I'm wondering where that money's going to come from. So a little, just a little concerned about the investment priorities may not reflect what each of the different uh, areas within Dr. Cog really need. John, John, thank you very much. Uh, important, important point of view. Um, I would I would just ask you to look at the entirety of the proposal. I think it's a good balanced proposal. It does reflect that different parts of the region have different needs, but also that all parts of the region also need safety and multimodal investments um, as well. Um, I would also say in in regards to BRT, um, please please remember that this is a 30 year plan. It's not like we're making all these improvements over the course of the next five or ten years. This is a 30 year investment plan. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, we can't look at RTD situation over the last 
um, nine months um, and sort of project that out for the entirety of the next 30 years. Um, I think, you know, we all have a level of confidence that we're going to get through what has been a very challenging year this year, and it may take a little bit of time, but we're going to we're gonna get back on track. And then the final point about BRT is that um, all of those corridors have um, high levels of current bus, bus operations in those corridors, which is part of why RTD has a comfort level with those BRT corridors, because it doesn't represent a significant increase in terms of um, service costs to transition. It's, it's the capital, it's the capital um, piece, which I think, as we've indicated, relies on a combination of funding from um, not, not insignificantly being able to leverage federal discretionary grants for those projects. So I hope that helps. It does, and I appreciate that, um, and I, I recognize that, um, but I also recognize that, uh, you know, not every one of these things fits every corridor, and when we, you know, highlight one and, and basically leave out others, it, it just is a concern to me, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, John. Cam, are there additional hands raised? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next person we have is Sarah Grant. So Sarah, when you're ready, please go ahead. Great, thank you. This is Sarah from the City and County of Broomfield. And I just want to reiterate the, the wonderful work that's been done by Dr. Cog and CDOT and everybody involved with this. This is um, a really great plan. And I think it reflects um, the priorities across the region and within the subregions as well. Um, so great job. I, got, I have a question for Jacob. I, um, I apologize. I need to make a clarification on the locally funded projects about State Highway 7 landage and which ones will be funded locally. And I'm wondering that if I can work with you um, after this to just make sure we clarify that locally funded um, aspect um, along with the adoption of, the, of, of what's presented here today. That's all right. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So I would suggest that, um, again, through this presentation, we did ask for a couple points of limited staff discretion. I think this is an example of that, um, although not called out in the motion. I think it's implied in the motion. And with consent from TAC, uh, we'd like to handle minor issues um, that Sarah, okay. you know, things like what Sarah is raising in that way, if there's no Perfect. objection. Perfect. Thank you, Jacob. Um, and my, my second one is a question or comment for CDOT. Um, one of the projects uh, that we had included was the US 36 interchange and some components of those phasing include upstream impacts to US 287, um, particular you know, safety impacts and, and multimodal, really trying to get that bus rapid transit between uh, US 36 and Longmont um, to, uh, through that interchange. And so my question to CDOT is if they saw some of the components of the US 287 project um, which does terminate at US 36 uh, to have some flexibility to be sure to include some of those in components in the US 36 interchange project. I understand there's a lot of overlap in that area of various uh, regional projects. Or I can follow up with, uh, with Jordan and, and Danny afterwards uh, of a clarification on, on that project. I, I'd suggest, sir, you follow up with them. Um, again, this is a planning level document, right. not a project level. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, is there additional hands raised, Cam? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, next, we have Brian Weimer. Brian, when you're ready, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, this is just a, I'd like Jacob to, um, give a perspective on this question, and that is realizing that this is a planning document, it does set forth um, kind of how we will implement the TIP in terms of availability. So my question really talks about, when you talk about active transportation projects, and only those projects that were listed in the plan so far under the allocation, uh, there will be many other um, active transportation projects that uh, potentially will be submitted through the TIP process. 
will they only be funded out of the allocation portion or will there be other funding available for those projects? And I think that helps kind of address the issues that were brought up before. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So here's my perspective and then Ron can chime in as needed. But, you know, the plan really sets the framework for the TIP and that actually goes back to, you know, to another set of federal requirements. You know, the 30 year plan in this case, <clears throat> really sets that vision for the region it sets that framework and then the tip is one of the important ways in which the plan is implemented not the only way but certainly one of the important ways w one of the things we're trying to do here is to be pretty intentional in the plan of setting a, a pretty specific framework with some flexibility but still set a specific framework that we can carry forward into future tip processes over time so while the specifics of those tip processes over time are to be defined you know through you know through that work um, the point here is that by calling out in the plan, by setting these markers and being intentional about some of these programmatic investment priorities that, that will provide some framework and some direction for uh, future TIP processes. I'd say the direct answer to your question, Brian, in my perspective is no, in the sense that whether it's active transportation or some of these other types of projects, yes, in the plan, we are trying to set aside these sort of programmatic sort of buckets for these projects. But I think when it comes to a specific TIP over time, it will be those things and probably others in terms of funding resources that will be available for those types of projects. I mean, we want to bring all resources to bear that we can in terms of, you know, funding, say, a safety project or an active transportation project. So I don't think it's limited um, to the sort of programmatic buckets that we're showing in the plan. I think that's a framework uh, to, to really sort of um, create that emphasis for those types of projects going forward into a TIP process. What Jacob said. Thank you, Thank and I you. think that's important to note as we move forward with this, that there is, it will be that flexibility, um, not knowing what the tips will look like in the future, but there will be that that opportunity. So I think that's important to know. Yep, thanks, Brian. Thanks. Cam, are there additional hands raised? Uh, yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, next, we have Art Griffith. So Art, when you're ready, it's all you. Art, if you would also just identify where you're from so that those on the line that are from the public could know, that'd be great. Go ahead, Art. Thank you, I needed to be unmuted there. Um, you know, it's kind of an old <laughs> comment and I think Ron kind of, uh, sunset it but i had um written out um for the motion trying to get back to the motion here and i kind of like still think it would be worthwhile to tack on the end something like a semicolon and said recognizing metro vision goals and objectives are considered we're considered in developing these these recommendations or something i i I know it's a living document. I know it's a long-term plan, but we're going with what the Metro Vision goals that were approved by the board. So I'm trying to get back to the motion anyway, but I threw that out there. Again, it says something like recognizing Metro Vision goals and objectives were considered in developing these recommendations or something. But other than that, I wanna see if we can get back to a motion. Okay, so are you making that in a form of a, a motion to to add that? I, I like it and Phil started the idea, but uh, yes, but it, it, if Ron or Dr. Cog's staff still think it's inappropriate, then I would with also withdraw it. Art, right, this, this is Ron. I, you know, I don't, I don't think we have a strong objection. I, you know, I, I appreciate, I appreciate the sentiment behind it. Um, and I, I think if uh, if you and Phil want to move forward with um, uh, an amendment to the motion to reflect that, I think I think we're okay with it. Um, we well, then we I feel will like we we feel like it's fully reflected in sort of the staff report and the conversations, everything we've talking about. We've talked about it's certainly consistent with that. So I think if if you guys want to move forward with amending the motion uh, with your I, language, we're okay. I, I would I would like to move forward with that, and I I guess I need the second amendment maker brian to agree is that a friendly amendment 
Yes. Okay, Brian, do you agree with that as the second to the motion? Yes, I think it needs to be general. I didn't want to get into two specifics because there's a lot of um, um, different components that go along with it. So if it's in terms of of um, development of this plan. So if it's it's general following uh, Metro Vision, I would uh, concur with that and support okay. that. Okay, we'll, we'll make it that as a friendly amendment um, then. Uh, Kim, is there any additional speakers? No, Mr. Chair, uh, at this time Kent? I don't see any more hands for a- Cam and Kent? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Matt Callison, uh, Arapahoe County, City of Aurora. I've been, I have my hand raised. You just can't see it because I'm on a cellular phone connection. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, I, I, again, want to recognize and appreciate uh, uh, truly a team effort. Uh, Ron and Jacob, uh, his, their Dr. Cog team, C. RTD, et cetera, as well as all, all the forms and, and jurisdictions. Uh, uh, membership in in the in those organizations or entities, as such. Just a couple of questions and comments uh, relative to the C470 managed lanes Wadsworth extension. Uh, Jordan, you, you spoke to that as an ad, so that is purely an ad from a from a fiscal const overall planning level fiscal constraint perspective versus uh, a, a replacement or a or a modification from another project. That's my first question. Hi, hi, Mac. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for um, the clarification question. That is correct. Those that addition would be with CDOT controlled funds. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, second question relative to. Um, the uh, Regional Transportation District administered multimodal capital funds uh, on that. Recognizing the uh, uh, RTD efforts on, on reimagine uh, continuing uh, to be uh, uh, discussed and, and re, uh, uh, reinitiated in the, in the January, February timeframe. And then the RTD Accountability Committee and the various uh, three subcommittees on that I was interested if there had been any considerations and discussion with that as it relates to the Northwest Rail uh, project, implementing the peak period service plan on that. That's a second question. Can you can you say that second question one more time, Mac? Just be clear what you're getting at. Uh, right. I just wanted to. Find out, you know, some of the subcommittees, uh, uh, particularly the uh, the uh, financial uh, as well as operations, but principally the financial, I believe, uh, had uh, identified uh, the con uh, completion of fast tracks, remaining fast tracks, corridors, and projects as a uh, item of committee subcommittee discussion on that. So I was interested had there been any internal discussions with the Dr. Cog team with the RTD group relative to how the Northwest Rail uh, implementing peak period service plan uh, as represented in this plan. Yes, Mac, we did we did have conversations with RTD about that. Um, obviously just added you know adding the additional time to the horizon for this plan from 2040. Um, the, the significant cost to complete fast tracks by 2050. Uh, we just couldn't, in good conscience, in conscience, include all of that in this in this current version of the 2050 RTP proposal. Um, but we felt like we could at least address the peak period peak period service uh, plan for Northwest Rail um, in this plan. We'll obviously learn a lot more. Um, over the next few years, and as the RTD Accountability Committee wraps up its work, and the and um, reimagine RTD effort picks up again, um, and we kind of get through this current financial situation, 
uh, probably the next iteration of the regional transportation plan, we'll be able to take a, a, a better look at the uh, uh, remainder of the fast tracks program. All right. Thanks, Ron, for, for that. Um, uh, in, a, in addition to that, within the same category, the uh, looking at bus rapid transit, uh, I noticed it may be helpful to have uh, multiple counties identified in the Spear, Leedsdale, Parker, BRT, for instance, example, Arapahoe County in, in that case, uh, Adams in Arapahoe County in the in the uh, with the Colfax extension. Uh, a Colfax Avenue extension, BRT out to E470, things of that nature um, uh, on that. And then lastly, uh, relative to E470, I don't know if we have uh, uh, E470 reps uh, uh, on the call meeting today or not, but the 30, uh, the E470 widening I-70 to Pena uh, our understanding is with coordination with E470 that that project is going to be actually extended north, I believe, to uh, somewhere between 104th to 120th. So uh, something to follow up with E470 directly, but just a, a call out there for a heads up. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. Um, the the, um, are the, if anyone else is on the phone for, that's a TAC member that would like to speak, please star six and speak up. Mr. Chair, Bill Soroy did raise his hand. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. Soroy, please go on and please identify with the organization you're with. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this is Bill Soroy with RTD. I just did want to respond to a couple of things that have been brought up. Um, one, like Max said, um, obviously there's a lot of interest in finishing fast tracks and our board ident is identified as a clear priority. Um, I think the one thing I do want to note about that, though, just as a, as a matter of course, is our board, because um, if board members are listening, they aren't listening, but is they hear about this, we have not at a board de defined, defined any kind of priority for the remaining fast tracks projects. Our intent is to address that as part of reimagine as we restart it. Um, so we'll we'll be doing that. Um, like Mac acknowledged, um, you know, the accountability committee is weighing in as well. Um, but we do, you know, we do have a, a some uncertainty and you know and we don't know in terms of uh, where we're going to be, but we will be going through that process next year. So I wanted to make sure that everybody understood that. I think in, in relation to an earlier comment about BRT, um, I do think that it is worth to note is that most of the BRT projects that were submitted were submitted by locals and not by RTD. Um, obviously, we are very supportive of all the BRT options. And, and I think like Ron acknowledged, most of the BRT corridors, I think that have been identified have a significant level of service already. So we are, you know, again, excited about that opportunity in the future. And We'll be addressing that as part of Reimagine as well. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Um, Cam, are there any additional hands raised? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. At this time, I don't see any more hands. Uh, no more hands raised at as of this time. Okay. We have before us a motion in a second to approve this item um, with the uh, friendly amendment and. Um, I would uh, ask Kim to unmute that, and, and we'll in a minute. We'll in a few uh, seconds. We'll vote. Hey, Mr. Chair. Yes. This is Jacob. Could I ask um, if there's going to be that amendment that Art and Phil are suggesting? Could they read that off again? And I can. I have the slide up. I can type it in so we all see what you're about to vote on. Uh, I appreciate that, Art. There you go. Um, and so after that, before that period, put a semicolon or a comma, whatever you like, but recognizing MetroVision goals and objectives were considered in developing these recommendations. Thank you, Art. So we have a um, the motion in a second, and Cam, or let me know when everyone's unmuted. 
Yes, Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, everyone is uh, unmuted. Okay, all TAC members uh, voting for the um, motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed aye. say no. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to some administrative items. Um, Carson Priest, if you would give the update on the uh, AMP working group, um, would appreciate it, and also identify what uh, who you represent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Carson Priest. I'm representing the non-motorized vehicle chair. I'm with Smart Commute Metro North, TMA in the North Metro region. Um, as far as the AMP working group update goes, we met earlier this month to hear some updates from the three focus area subcommittees that include data and data sharing, shared mobility, and system operations. At the meeting, the group also heard some informational briefings regarding Mobility Evolution Initiative, a mobility choice project in the DPC area, given by um, Tyler from Colorado Smart Cities Alliance. We also heard an informational briefing from CDOT's statewide uh, micromobility resource creation process, uh, and that was given by Lisa Streisfeld. Um, that is all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Carson. Uh, are there other matters that need to come before this uh, group today? Uh, please raise your hand, TAC members. Cam, are there any hands raised? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have a hand raised from Eileen Yazi. Uh, Eileen, please go ahead and please state um, what organization you, you are a part of. Sure. Um, this is Eileen Yazi, City County of Denver. Um, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. I have a question, and this may be, uh, this is a request for a future agenda item, and I don't know if it comes in December or January. Just looking for an update from Dr. Cog um, related to kind of what's happening at the federal level, and obviously we know um, next week can change a lot of things, um, but if there's an update that you could put on the agenda for maybe um, December, January, February, just at the federal level, if there's anything related to a stimulus, the HEROES bill, um, anything like that. Eileen, thank you. This is Ron. That's, a, that's an excellent idea. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely um, pick out a good time after the first year to, to have that conversation with TAC. I think that's an excellent suggestion. There will, is likely to be a lot of change. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Eileen. Any other uh, matters? Uh, any other hands raised, Cam? No, Mr. Chair, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. Okay. Our next meeting is on December 7th um, and at 3.52, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.